I'm really happy to have this opportunity to talk about next generation DDoS defense with Cyan. Uh, I started publishing in this area of internet DDoS defense 16 years ago to the month. Uh, we had this paper at SIGCOM about how to protect uh, the, the connection setup uh, phase uh, from the denial of capability attack. And this is an example of a piece of work that is so much easier to do today in Scion uh, than it was in the internet 16 years ago, and in fact, than it is in the internet today. So despite the fact that academics have been working on this problem of internet DDoS defense uh, for over 20 years, what we have today in the internet is still quite limited. And it's a hard problem for six reasons that I will talk about here and probably uh, many others. The first is that there is no per packet source address verification. Uh, so for a long time, there was no source address verification at all. There was no way to know that a packet came from uh, an authorized user of a particular prefix of IP addresses. Now, in the last few years, that has changed with the rise of PKI, or sorry, of RPKI, uh, a PKI for routing that allows us now to have uh, BGP know that the speaker for a prefix is in fact authorized. However, this is only for routing packets, and it is quite unlikely that we'll be able to see this uh, RPKI system extended to allow per packet uh, validation of source addresses. The second problem is that the internet lacks roots of trust. Uh, so if you think about uh, the distribution of IP addresses or the distribution of um, autonomous system numbers. Um, these are uh, concentrated in a single entity, IANA, and then delegated out from there. Um, now, for a long time, IANA was a US corporation, um, and certainly there were some people, let's say in China, that might not have been entirely happy with that state of affairs. You can think about the complete opposite end of the spectrum, which is how we do certificate verification for websites. There are so many certificate authorities, and many of these authorities might not be trustworthy, and certainly you would be hard pressed to name more than a handful of them. And yet your browser by default uh, is trusting all of these entities to, um, to certify that a certain website is coming from the authorized owner of that domain. So this is a very difficult problem in the internet. You have a global network, uh, and either you have uh, a global point of trust, which I don't think really exists today, uh, or you have a bunch of different points of trust, uh, and some of them might actually not be trustworthy. The internet was developed a long time ago, and a long time ago, co computational uh, resources were expensive. Today, we can uh, perform certain types of uh, cryptographic operations relatively quickly and on relatively inexpensive hardware. Uh, but when the internet was developed, we didn't have such things. And so uh, when the, the internet protocols uh, for packet forwarding have no in-network crypto. And this makes it difficult to do many things like packet verification um, and authenticity of source and so forth. Next, inter-AS coordination is hard. Uh, so on the internet, we have this thing called BCP39 that says that you as an ISP are supposed to make sure that your customers do not spoof IP addresses and send such spoofed packets into the internet. Uh, now the difficulty with this is that it requires that the ASs coordinate and figure out uh, from each um, place, from each ingress point into the network, what set of source IP addresses are acceptable. Um, and this level of coordination is so difficult that despite uh, BCP39 being around for a very long time, we still have uh, rampant IP address spoofing in the internet today. The next problem is that of incremental deployment. When you build a protocol and you get it as widely and successfully deployed as the internet, it is very difficult to have a flag day where you say, after this date, 
Nobody is going to speak IPv4. Everybody is going to speak IPv6. So what that means is that any protocol that you want to have any hope of deploying on the internet must be incrementally deployable. It must give you benefits when you deploy it at just a few locations. And so many of these um, uh, visionary, dramatic um, internet um, improvement protocols, uh, such as the use of capabilities, for example, have not found widespread acceptance because they are difficult to incrementally deploy. A final issue is the lack of path transparency. Um, as we will see later, in the internet, a packet contains very little information about its path. And this makes it difficult, for example, to send a packet back to the source from which it came. All right, so given all of these challenges, what do people do on the internet today? I'm going to present two um, example approaches. Of course, uh, there are hundreds. Um, but you can buy commercial service uh, from an uh, entity called Cloudflare. Uh, what Cloudflare does is it will terminate all of your connections. So if somebody wants to reach your website um, through DNS, they are going to reach a Cloudflare server, a server that is not controlled by you. Um, at that point, Cloudflare will apply. And, and notice here, by the way, that Cloudflare sits in the value chain even when it's not providing any value. Right? It's terminating all of your connections when you're not under attack, and you're paying them, OK? So, um, so Cloudflare sits there, and then they filter with their proprietary filters, uh, which know nothing about the customer. They have some ideas of these sources are malicious, those sources are good, and they apply these filters, and then they deliver your traffic to you over a dedicated link that you, of course, pay for. Uh, so that is how Cloudflare works. Uh, we looked at this and we thought, well, we can do better than that. So we also sit in the value chain while we're providing no value. Uh, we terminate the connections at our middle boxes, which sit in the cloud. Uh, we then apply destination-selected policies, which is perhaps slightly better. Uh, but we lack that intelligence of all of the um, all of the attack traffic that Cloudflare gets, right? So uh, that's maybe a little bit of a downside. And then instead of terminating over dedicated last mile connections, we said, you know, uh, we can just apply packet filtering using access control lists at the ISP. So we somehow bribe the ISP uh, to stick in certain, I certain access control uh, mechanisms. And that ensures that the attackers that are trying to bypass our cloud middle boxes are denied. Okay, so that's another example of how you can solve uh, DDoS attacks in today's internet. But the main thing I want you to come away from uh, today is that any defense mechanism that works on the internet is going to work on Scion. And you might think that's a really bold claim for you to make because you know about a handful of internet uh, DDoS defense strategies. What if there's one that has been developed or is about to be developed that you don't know about and it's just not going to work in Scion? And I'm going to give you an argument for why I believe this. So on the left is a picture of an IPv4 packet header. On the right is a picture of a Scion packet header with a standard path extension. So I'm going to compare these piece by piece because I know they're a little bit too hard, too small to read. First of all, this red piece here, you should not consider it part of the routing packet header because if the router changes any of these fields, bad things will happen to the destination. Uh, this is effectively a piece of the packet uh, that is part of the end host protocol that happens to be embedded in IPv4 for legacy reasons. So we'll ignore that. Next, we have the stuff that every routing protocol needs. How long is this packet? How large is the header? What version of the protocol am I running? What type of protocol is this? Is this a TCP packet? Is it a UDP packet? And so forth. So that's here highlighted in the green. And as you can see, they're basically the same from one to the other. Next, we have information about the source and the destination. So we have the source address and the destination address highlighted in uh, cyan color here. And in the cyan header, um, it's a little bit bigger, but it's uh, basically the same idea. It's where is it going and from whence has it come. Now, the biggest distinction between these two 
is what's highlighted here in yellow. This is the entirety of the path information that is contained in the packet. On the left side, we have uh, the time to live. Um, and this just gives us a lower bound on the amount of time that, um, uh, on the number of hops that the, the packet has traversed. So it's somewhere between, it's traversed between one and 256 hops. Uh, and these days, people start their TTLs around 60. And so even at the first hop, your lower bound for how many hops you've traversed is like 180. Uh, this is not very useful information. On the other hand, Cyan here has uh, the entire um, path as well as uh, some information about the path type. So what is the difference here? Cyan gives us ISDs. They give us trust routes. Uh, Cyan gives us path transparency. This stops reflection attacks. It also enables certain other types of defenses. Also, these path types, as the network evolves, allows us to accommodate in-network crypto and source AS authentication through something like Epic. So let me give you an example of how this path information helps. Um, this is a common attack called reflection. The idea is I have a server that takes small packets and replies to you with large packets. This could be DNS. I'm looking up domain name. Uh, this could be NTP. I'm trying to uh, adjust my clock. Um, and the only thing that you have in IP is the source IP address. But as I mentioned earlier, you can spoof the source IP address. So what the attacker does is on their small link, they send a bunch of packets that are going to get amplified by this reflector. This reflector is going to make them grow by an order of magnitude or more. And then those packets are going to go to the victim. So what that means is for a, let's say, a one gigabit output, you can get, let's say, 10 to 30 gigabits sent over to your victim. This is not possible in Cyan, because in Cyan, what we do is we reverse the path. And so uh, the source of these, sor these um, requests has to be somewhere along the path. Uh, so one way we can avoid DDoS uh, uh, attacks um, is through path migration. And the idea of path migration is that there are many paths, um, and you discover these paths uh, through the beaconing process. And you can only use a path that has been beaconed to the destination and then provided through path discovery for the source to use. And so what this destination can do is it can retain some of these paths and only use them for sources that it knows that somehow it has already authenticated. And therefore, it can take these um, known good uh, senders and send them along a path that is different from the public paths. And of course, this is something that is not possible in today's internet. Cyan features also allow us to have reservations. Uh, so we have trust routes, and as a result of those trust routes, we can do per packet, per source authentication. There are protocols such as Epic for doing this, and they allow the first packet to be authenticated. Um, this uh, allows us to build things that give us in-network reservations with guaranteed bandwidths. Um, and you need uh, AOS authentication, you need duplicate suppression, you need large flow detection in order to get this. Uh, but there are, are protocols running in Cyan today that uh, give us this kind of fairness guarantee against Crossfire-style attacks. Now, with reservations, you say, well, that's great. If you have a reservation, you can get through. But how do we know the attacker is not going to get all the reservations? And there's fundamentally two ways to deal with DDoS. The first is that you identify the attackers and you remove their traffic. This is difficult because you need to ensure that the attackers are going to behave in some way that allows you uh, to, to filter them. The other is that you have some fairness notion. Um, and what Cyan does is it gives us tools uh, for source AS authentication uh, that allow us to enforce different fairness notions. For example, Colibri has per source AS fairness. Uh, and as a result, whether there's one attacker in a source AS or many attackers in a source AS, it doesn't change the amount of reservation available for anyone in any other source AS. Uh, other examples of this are Lightning Filter, GMA, and Docile. There are other ideas of in-network fairness notion. 
Uh, Lightning filter allows us to have some idea of fairness on a per source AS basis. Uh, GMA and Docile work on a hop by hop basis. Uh, but these authenticators give us the ability uh, to implement arbitrary forms of fairness notions. So today's Scion gives us hidden paths uh, in production Scion. We've got DRK, Colibri, and Epic in Scion Lab. Uh, and in conclusion, anything that works on the internet is going to work on Scion. Um, and Scion also has a suite of protocols built on uniquely Scion features that defend against DDoS and cannot be used on the internet. Thank you. <laughs>